everyone, and welcome to the Hereditary Disease Foundation's May Research Spotlight webinar. I'm Megan Donaldson, CEO of the HDF, and I'm especially pleased to welcome you during this month of May as we observe Huntington's Disease Awareness Month. If you follow us on social media, you know that we are featuring short videos telling the stories of HD families, as well as our scientists, many whose research has been funded by the Hereditary Disease Foundation, thanks to the generosity of our donors. If you're not yet following us on social media, please join us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or check out our website to learn more about the families whose lives are impacted by Huntington's disease and the extraordinary scientists who are working to develop treatments and cures for HD. Today, we are thrilled to have with us Dr. Elena Cataneo, a scientist and citizen who has distinguished herself in so many extraordinary ways. She is the co-founding director of UNISTEM, the Center for Stem Cell Research at the University of Milan. In 2013, Elena was appointed Senator for Life of the Italian Parliament, an extremely rare honor awarded by the President of the Italian Republic for her outstanding merits in science that have honored her country. Since that time, Elena travels between her laboratory in Milan and the Senate in Rome. So it comes as no surprise that this extraordinary scientist was awarded the 2021 Leslie Gary Brenner Prize for Innovation in Science. To quote Elena, like artists, scientists look with different eyes. Today, Elena's presentation will take us on an amazing journey through the history of the Huntington gene. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen throughout her talk, and Elena will be available to answer them at the end of her talk. Elena will also have a special surprise for us at the end of her talk. So even if you don't have questions, I invite you to continue watching. We also have the chat button available if you would like to comment on her presentation or just say hello. It is now my pleasure to introduce Elena Cataneo, giving a talk entitled Huntington, the story of an ancient and innocent gene. Welcome Elena, and thank you for joining us today. Hello everyone, I am Elena Cattaneo and right now I am in my laboratory, in my institute, in the very center of Milano and uh, you see in the slides where we are on the fourth floor of this building and uh, we are actually just a few blocks away from uh, Duomo Square, from the La Scala Theatre, from the Sforza Castle and uh, from the former Dominican convent where the magnificent Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper is located. And from this corner of the world, I would like uh, to express my gratitude to Frank Gehry and uh, his family for awarding me the Leslie Brenner Gehry Prize for Innovation in Science. And for me, Receiving this uh, award is a commitment uh, to uh, the future. And here I just want to restate my commitment uh, to Huntington disease uh, research. And I would like to honor this award uh, and the memory and the creativity of the person to whom this award is dedicated, starting from this image that you see on the slide, the image of this uh, fresco by Michelangelo. Uh, it is the creation of Adam, and uh, you can admire this painting in the Sistine Chapel in, uh, in Rome. And uh, I would like to use this beautiful image simply to remind you that uh, we are made up of trillions of cells. And uh, within each of our cells, uh, we have our uh, DNA. And within the DNA is the gene we are so interested in, the Huntington gene. And uh, this is where our journey through the history of this gene begins. And uh, you see, I mean, how the journey, I mean, is going to develop, but I would like to say that the journey really begins with this hug, and uh, she's Nancy an extraordinary uh, person and a scholar whose uh, commitment and dedication have been uh, really the starting uh, point in the formation of an entire scientific community dedicated to Huntington disease research. 
And it took just one hug with me, and it was because of that hug that I decided that to dedicate my life to this disease. And it is for that hug that uh, I'm now here with you today. And uh, yeah, this is our target gene, the Huntington gene, one letter after the other. You see the beginning of the gene in the slide. You see the several letters that compose this gene. And uh, we know that at the 18th triplet of this gene, we read the letters in triplets. There are warring triplets. And you see them here in red. CAG, 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 one after the other. When the number of these consequent triplets of CAG exceeds 36, the disease will strike. So Huntington disease is due to the present, to the presence of a mutant version of the Huntington gene carrying more than 36 repeats. And because of these too many repetitions, some neurons in our brain that control our movements and our behavior will suffer, become intoxicated, will malfunction and eventually degenerate. And clinical symptoms in Huntington disease are due to the loss of these neurons. And many of us working on Huntington disease are working to interfere with the toxicity of this uh, mutant gene. But our journey today will take a different path, as you see from the slide, because uh, I would like you to consider that the Huntington gene is also present in our DNA, in the DNA of all of us, but as you see here from the slide, in a more, I would say, more normal version. I mean, with less CAG repeats below 35. I can carry 10 CAG repeats in my gene, my friend can carry 20, my colleague 28, but we are all normal for, for that gene as the number of CAG is below 35, which is the normal range. And with you today, I would like to raise these two questions that you see in the slide. I would like to know why we all carry the Huntington gene in our DNA. And second, I would like to know why we carry that gene with those CAG repeats uh, in our normal gene. So why are the CAG there in my gene? Why didn't evolution get rid of those CAGs as they can become so dangerous when uh, they get uh, longer. So I will start with the first question. So why do we all carry the normal Huntington gene in our DNA? To try to address this question, uh, we, uh, some years ago, we and other uh, colleagues uh, did uh, an experiment that you see here in the slide. We took cells and uh, in some of them, we added more or the normal Huntington gene, which is here depicted in green. And in some other cells, we added more of the mutant Huntington gene. And then we exposed these cells to some toxins, to some stressful condition, to see how well they would behave in the presence of the mutant or normal gene. And what we found is that when we expose the cells to these stressful conditions, we observe that, well, the regular cells, the regular plates in yellow with the regular cells, uh, these are the cells that were not experimentally manipulated. Well, we found that some of them, as you see from the slide, degenerate, so they die, about 20% of them. And then, as you see at the bottom of the slide, uh, when cells, cells pre in the presence of mutant antintin, simply there is more cell death. And this was sort of expected. 80% of the cells in the dish degenerate because of the presence of the mutant antintin gene. But then the surprise was to see what happens to cells carrying an excess 
or the normal huntington gene. You see from the slide that basically these cells survive. I mean, they do not degenerate. In some way, they are protected by the toxicity of those stressful conditions because of the presence of normal of the normal Huntington gene. In other words, I mean, this experiment was telling us that the normal Huntington gene is protecting our cells, is protecting our neurons. So this is exactly the first message that I would like to convey to you, I mean, from, from our laboratories. The normal Huntington gene is beneficial to our cells. Then the next question. Why are the CAGs present in our normal Huntington gene? I mean, given that, as I mentioned, they can become dangerous when they get longer. And yes, yeah, I already told you, but I would like to reiterate, we all have the gene, we all had the gene with those CAG repeats. Why is that? Why and why, I mean, we are actually variable in the number of CAGs that is present in our gene. I told you I can carry 20, another person 25. So the question is also, why don't we all carry the exact same number of CAGs in our normal Huntington gene? Isn't that interesting? Why are we variable? Although, I mean, we are all below. 35. I mean, what can possibly mean, I mean, having these CAG repeats in different flavors in our normal, in our normal gene? Okay, so I think we answered to the first question. So we carry the Huntington gene because it is beneficial to our cells. Now, the next question. So why are the CAGs present in our normal, in our normal Huntington gene, given that they can become dangerous when they get longer. And yes, I already told you, but I want to reiterate that we all have the gene and that uh, we all have those CAG repeats in our normal Huntington gene. But uh, I would like to mention, as you see here, that we carry the gene with those CRG repeats in different flavors. So again, I told you some of us can have 20, some other 28, some other 30. So we are variable. Um, so the question, so this is interesting, right? So the, the question is, uh, why are, I mean, why don't we all carry the exact same number of CAG in our gene? And what can possibly mean? I mean, having these CAG repeats in different flavors in our normal Huntington gene. And uh, well, in the past, the presence of these CAG repeats in our normal Huntington gene was considered meaningless, a sort of junk DNA. But you know, this idea was uh, quite bizarre. So we and others decided to dig more into the history of the CAG uh, repeats. And in order to do that, we look back in evolution at the origin of the human Huntington gene. I mean, trying to understand when and why, I mean, these CAG repeats have appeared in our gene. And by looking back at evolution, these colleagues made an amazing discovery. They found that the Huntington gene, the one that we carry in our DNA, originated one billion years ago. In this species, is a Dictyostelium discoideum, is a slime mold in amoeba, a very primitive species. And this is really, to me, amazing. So Dicti, as we call it, has the Huntington gene, which is similar to my Huntington gene. And the interesting thing about Dicti is that, uh, well, Dictyostelium is the first multicellular organism that, uh, to appear on Earth, and it has Huntington. Actually, during its life cycle, Dicti goes from unicellular, from being unicellular when there is food around, to multicellular with all cells getting together when the food is scarce 
and they have to find new food. And this is shown in this beautiful video. As uh, the beautiful uh, video has shown, Huntington is important for single cells to unite and transform into a stronger multicellular organism. And, and we know that because uh, in this paper that you see here in the slides, our colleagues have eliminated Huntington from Dicti and found that cells were no longer able to get together and remain disorganized. So, we learned a lot already about the normal Huntington gene. And what you see here is the tree of life. Here at the bottom is the origin of life on Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And one billion years ago, as I told you, Dicti appeared on Earth. It is pluricellular and it has Huntington. And keep in mind that a pluricellular, a multicellular organism is a kind of an organized society in which single cells, single individuals become united for a better life. Alone, single cells would die, but altogether they will survive. And Huntington, again, I mean, is involved in all of this. And for this reason, we all sympathize with this uh, normal Huntington gene uh, not only because it is an ancient and old uh, gene, but also because it looks very social and, um, and very cool. I mean, it unites individuals. But I want to stay with you a little more on, uh, on this very initial part of life on Earth. Uh, even before uh, Dicti, uh, because before Dicti, which is pluricellular, we have, as you see from the slide, we have yeast, and yeast is unicellular. And of course, the question is, I mean, does yeast have uh, antintin? And the answer is no, there is no antintin in, uh, in yeast. So the story of the gene really begins when the first multicellular organism emerges uh, during uh, evolution. So it is. Again, I mean, messages from the laboratory. It is very ancient and, uh, and very important for life, for the formation of pluricellular organisms. And before moving up along the evolutionary path, I still want to spend a few more minutes digging with you into this uh, basal zone where the first species are found. And here, uh, just before Dicti, you see that the tree of life shows a bifurcation, a bifurcation that will give rise to the plant kingdom. And uh, as you may imagine, as plants have appeared before Dicti, they have no Huntington. And indeed, I mean, this is true. Well, we were curious and wondered what happens if we introduce Huntington into plants. 
And now you will see results that uh, no one has seen yet, not even my fellow scientists. These are uh, new data that uh, require further independent validation, as always in science, but I want to share this data with you. Here is the experiment. We took this plant, the name is Arabidopsis thaliana. It is a plant with its root, leaves, stem, flowers, and seeds. And what we did here, we introduced Han Tin Tin into this plant. And well, plants were very happy to the point that, as you see here, on the left is the regular plant, on the right is the same plant plus Han Tin Tin. And you see that the stem is much taller, the flowers are bigger, the size of the leaves has increased. And if we zoom in to the cells of the leaves, we see that the cells are much bigger in the presence of antintin. And finally, well, as all organisms, also plants have uh, several good days of life that terminates, in the case of this plant, at day 57 after germination, as you see here from the slides. But then what happens in the presence of huntintin? Well, plants carrying the normal huntintin gene live much longer. And I would say this is not bad for a disease gene. I mean, its normal version seems to be very important. The data we are accumulating keep saying that normal huntintin is very important. So not only it is this ancient gene, but it can increase the survival of organisms that do not carry the gene by themselves. So now I want to go back again to Dicti, to our tree of life. I told you this is uh, that Dicti is the first species on earth to carry the Huntington gene, and this is beautiful. I already told you everything. But I haven't told you the most important discovery that our colleagues made. Because, well, if you look in detail at the Dicti Huntington gene, I mean, all the letters in the Dicti gene, we see that there is a gene, of course, but look at the 18th triplet. There are no CAG repeats. There are no CAGs. In, uh, in Dicti, there are no CAG repeats. And uh, that's why we say that uh, when the gene was born in Dicti, one billion years ago, it was born innocent without CAG. So this is the story of the ancient and innocent, innocent gene. These are the messages up to now from the laboratory. And I want to continue, I mean, on this, uh, along this uh, tree of uh, life, because now we are very curious about how the story goes and what happens next. And uh, yeah, there were uh, no CAG initially when the gene was born. But somewhere, I mean, these uh, CAGs must have uh, popped up because we, up here, we do have those uh, CAG letters in our gene. And well, as you see here from the slide, after Dicti, evolution has divided into two branches. And you see here the two branches on this slide. And actually, you see them better in the next slide, in this uh, slide. On the one side, we had the protostom branch, where, which, uh, where all insects are, while on the other side, uh, there is the deuterostom branch, which is our branch. And we see the different species uh, that have evolved along uh, these uh, uh, two branches. So, first, we and other look at insects. I mean, we wanted to see whether Huntington was there, whether the CAG were there in the uh, insect gene, but what we found is that, yes, the gene is there in the different insects, but there are no CAG repeats. So the story becomes more and more intriguing because it is clear from this uh, slide uh, that uh, the CAG in the Huntington gene is part of our branch of, of evolution. So we decided to try and reconstruct the evolution of the gene and of the CAG along the deuterostom branch, along our branch. And to do that, we have also collected, we have collected many samples, DNA and tissues 
from several colleagues, from several suppliers throughout the world because we wanted to, I mean, track I mean, the uh, hunting team gene and the CAG in the different uh, species. And we first focus on the very basal, I would say the most primitive uh, species in the deuterostom branch, the very basal one. And this is sea urchin. I remember going to the fish market to buy some sea urchin. The, the sea urchin we used to uh, make uh, awesome uh, spaghetti, but in this case we were taking the sea urchin to the laboratory to extract its DNA and look for the Huntington gene and for the presence of the CAG repeats. And we discovered that the Huntington gene is there in sea urchin and surprise, we found for the first time two CAG repeats in this species in the sea urchin Huntington gene. So we were able to identify the species in which the CAG has first appeared, I would say, half a billion uh, years ago uh, in sea urchin. And sea urchin is another very interesting uh, species because uh, it is the first species that carries a very primitive ring of a nervous system. It carries two CAG, as I told you. Dicti has no nervous system and no CAG. And I don't know if you see where I will take you. Well, the hypothesis is that the appearance of the CAG in sea urchin Huntington has something to do with the appearance and or the development of a very primitive form of a nervous system. And uh, by looking at other species, we discover that not only the CAG has been maintained during evolution over the many millennia, but it has actually increased in size in coincidence with the appearance of species with a progressively more evolved nervous system. As you see here, four CAG in fishes, seven in mice, eight in rats, 10 in sheep, 12 in pigs, and 15 and more in monkeys, and then us with between nine and, 39, and 35 CAG repeats. So the idea that the CAG has appearance of the CAG and the elongation during evolution of the CAG has something to do with the formation and evolution of the nervous system in the different species is on the table. So this is where uh, we are now with the messages from the laboratory with this data showing that the CAG appears, has appeared first in uh, sea urchin Antintin and in the following millennia the size of the CAG repeats has increased uh, in coincidence with the appearance of progressively more evolved species. And the question is, uh, how is it that the CAG repeats has been maintained during evolution? Actually, it has increased in size. And we can actually measure whether there has been an evolutionary uh, pressure, so a kind of pressure uh, to keep the CAG trait uh, unchanged uh, during uh, evolution. And we've done, I mean, this work, and we discovered that, uh, yes, the CAG repeat is under evolutionary pressure uh, in order to maintain, I mean, this trait unchanged. And normally, I mean, this is happen when pieces, on pieces of DNA, which are important. So, uh, for this pressure to operate, the CAG repeats must perform a function. I mean, if this CAG repeat has been maintained unchanged, there must be a reason. Probably the CAG repeat has some important function. Can we identify this function? And the answer is yes. And we did this experiment. Of course, we went back to the cells and we can enter into the gene and genome of our cells and we can modify the Huntington gene as you see here from the slide, so that in a group of cells, I mean, the CAG repeats in the Huntington gene is basically zero. And then in another batch of cells, we can modify the cells so that they carry two CAG repeats in the Huntington gene, like sea urchin, or four, like in fish, or seven, like in mice, or eight, like in rats, and so on and so forth. And then we can ask the question, I mean, are these different cell, uh, different uh, batches of cells capable to give rise good uh, neurons? 
And when we tried to do this experiment, I mean, we were able to see, I mean, as, you, uh, as uh, this slide shows you, that basically the cells with no CG repeat, zero CG repeats, are not able to make neurons. The cells with two make a few, four, more, seven, better, and more, and better neurons with more and more CAG repeats. So the message is not only that the CAG is under evolutionary pressure, but that CAG repeat has a function which is important for our neuron. And now to close, uh, of course I want to spend the, the last few minutes talking about us, about our normal gene, the gene that we that is in our body today, we learned that the gene and the CAG came to us for good reason. The CAG has something to do with the, the, the gene and the CAG repeats, have something to do with the survival of our cells, of our neurons, with our capacity to generate uh, neurons. It seems that there is a sort of a relationship, no more CAG repeats, more nervous system. But how about us? I told you that we vary between 9 and 35 CAG repeats in our gene. In reality, we are all pushed to our more CAG repeats in our gene. So none of us is 9 or 10 or 11, very few, 12. We all have more, we are all pushed to our more CAG in our uh, gene to the point that one individual in 17 carries a CAG repetition in the normal range, but very high, between 27 and 35. You know, still in the healthy, but very high range. I mean, this is a surprise. And uh, if we now did an MRI scan of our brain today, we would actually find that those of us who are between 27 and 35 CAG repeats in their gene also have more gray matter in their brain. Does that mean more intelligence, more cognitive abilities? Probably, yes, but this is under investigation. So this is the end of our journey. More and more CAG repeats are added during evolution and high CAG in their normal range in our gene positively positively affects brain structure and possibly uh, connection. So we have a, an hypothesis here, and the hypothesis is that the CAG repeats in the normal Huntington gene is an evolutionary advantageous trait whose increasing size has been positively selected during evolution because it is critical for our uh, neurons. And now I would like to close by turning to our patients. And uh, we call them uh, sick, right? So Huntington patients have a C CAG number in their Huntington gene above the threshold, above 36. And yes, as a consequence of that, there is a serious disease to fight and we are all uh, fighting it all uh, together. But based on what you have heard, I would like to offer you a change of perspective that may affect the way we see the disease. And we're used to consider the disease as a consequence of a genetic error, a genetic mistake. But what if instead the disease and the excess number of those CAG repeats is the result of the evolutionary drive, which aims, as we have seen, aims to add more and more CAG repeats in our gene, little by little. It has been doing that, well, for a billion years. Well, if that is true, if the disease is the consequence of this evolutionary pressure to add more and more CAG repeats into our gene, then perhaps patients who have too many of those CAG repeats, well, maybe they are the frontier of human evolution and perhaps, or certainly, I mean, they are paying a high price for all of us, I mean, for our evolution, for human evolution, because today our brains cannot stand, I mean, more 
of those uh, uh, CA, more than 35 uh, CAG repeats, but uh, who knows, maybe tomorrow people with a CAG size that today causes the disease will be somehow selected in the course of evolution because of those extra CAG repeats, which would make them more functional, perhaps with better cognitive capabilities. And maybe in a few millennia, the normal range for human will be 40 or 45, and we will all be better performing. And this is an hypothesis we can work on. And this is how science proceeds. It allows us to raise questions that uh, no one has ever asked before, to overturn our prejudices, to overcome the stigma and the discrimination that plague diseases like this, to consider all human beings as part of our life, and who knows, perhaps the story of this ancient and innocent gene will one day tell us more about our evolution. And to close, I mean, this is a painting I really love by Andrea Montaigne on the ceiling of the wedding hall in the Ducal Palace of Mantova. It was made in the 15th century. Mantegna uh, painted on the ceiling uh, this oculus that you see here that opens illusionistically into a blue sky, reminding us uh, that, uh, yes, we can uh, develop ways uh, to go beyond what we see and know today, and uh, we can look at the fact with different eyes, and yes, we can change our perspective without fear when the evidence leads us into a new direction. And knowing that in doing that, none of us will be alone. And I hope that even from a distance, everyone can feel the embrace of all of us, all people that you see in this image, uh, an embrace from all colleagues, from an entire scientific and medical community working together to fight Huntington's disease. And really thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. Just beautiful. Um, I learned so much from that. And I just love all of your ways of um, telling us to change our perspective on people with Huntington's disease, turn it around and talk about them being on the frontiers of human evolution. And not only that, I love your perspective about turn, bringing art into this and even bringing in Italian food with your reference to the sea urchin spaghetti. So we'll have to get that recipe offline. But for everybody now, Elena has a very special um, gift to share with us. And so without further ado, I'm going to let her do that now. So please stay, stay on. Yeah. So, hello, can you see me? Can you hear me well? I, I hope so. And, um, well, uh, it is uh, really very nice. I'm so excited uh, to talk to you, I mean, from so many miles away. And uh, I should say that I am no longer in my laboratory in Milano, but uh, I am uh, speaking to you from Rome, from the Senate of the Italian uh, Republic, because on the Wednesdays, I'm always here in Rome, in the Senate. And right now I am in, um, in uh, one of the buildings of the Senate. The name of the building where I am now is Palazzo Giustiniani. This is one of the main buildings of the Italian Senate. And just to give you an idea of where we are, well, you should consider that, uh, you know, the Pantheon, the former Roman temple built over 2000 years ago is right next door. And you will see that in a second. We are a few blocks uh, from the Colosseum, a quarter of a mile from the Trevi Fountain or from the uh, Spanish Square with the Spanish stairs. We are one mile away from the Vatican City. So the Senate and its palaces are really located right in the center of Rome. And this building, houses the office of the president of the Senate, the offices of the former presidents of our Republic, and also the offices of the senators for life. 
and I am one of them, one of the five current life senators in the Italian parliament, which is uh, made up of uh, 1,000. Uh, including deputies and senators. So we have two chambers, the Senate and the deputy chamber. And what I want to do now is, uh, if I, I hope I will succeed, is uh, guide you briefly through this amazing building, through a part, a small part of the building, and take you to my office, which really I want to remind you is the office of a scientist who has always worked and will always work on Huntington disease, who was supported in uh, the difficult early stages of her career by a fellowship from the Hereditary Disease Foundation, and who unexpectedly in 2014 was nominated Senator for Life. So, so really here, here I am. I am the whole week in Milano in the lab, but on the Wednesday I'm here. And when I'm not here, I have a great staff, three people, I'm working with, you uh, uh, You will meet them uh, very soon. But now I want to start the tour, so I should turn my camera. Yes, okay. So now we are in Palazzo Giustiniani, which is yeah, one of the main buildings of the Senate. It is a beautiful palace. We are on the first floor of the palace. I want to show you this small courtyard of Palazzo Giustiniani. Yeah, that is the street. And just in front of us on the other side of the street is the building where the Senate chamber is. So I can go back and forth from the chamber very easily. Actually, there is a tunnel that, under, uh, that goes underneath the, the road. So I, can, I normally use the tunnel to go to the chamber. Okay, so we are first floor and in this area of the palace there are two only two rooms and i want to take you to the two rooms and the first one is an amazing room it's called uh, zuccari hall oh, it is a magnificent room yeah named after artist federico zuccari who painted the frescoes on the ceiling. Now, and there you have episodes of the stories of King Solomon. This is an amazing room. And of course, members of the parliament or the Senate can use this room, I mean, for their meetings, there are beautiful tapestries from the 17th century. Okay, so this is Zuccari Hall. And now I want to take you to the other room in this part of the building. And the other room is my office. So I'm going to my office. So this is a really a, a fantastic building. Okay. Yeah, and this is my office. Yeah, so you see. Yeah, Senatoria Vita, I mean, a vita means really for life. And for life means forever. No? And uh, yeah, forever means, I mean, to me, at least another 50 years of battles that I want to fight from here. I mean, so we are entering the office now. And these are members of my staff, the people I'm working with since many, many years Jose, Mariangela, and Marianna. And uh, yeah, I have great staff. I have plants. There is no, I swear, there is no hunting in, in these plants, but who knows, maybe one day or the other, I will try an experiment. And this is my office, my very small, tiny, beautiful office. And uh, of course I have view on the courtyard. You have seen the courtyard before. And on the other side of the office, so this is the office. There is a balcony. And I actually choose this office because of this marvelous balcony. And when you are on the balcony, well, if you look on the right, so now we are outside. This is Rome. Welcome to Rome. And this yellow building here is the building where the Senate chamber is. And the tunnel goes underneath here. 
So this is on one side of the balcony and then close your eyes and on the other side of the balcony is the Pantheon. Okay, so this is really next door because yeah, <laughs> the building end, ends there. And that is this marvelous <laughs> uh, church. Actually, it, it has turned into a church. It's one of the 1,000 churches we have in Rome. Okay. And now I'm going back to my office and uh, to my small table. That is a table where you know many discussion and plans and strategies are made with my staff first and then with colleagues from Italy, uh, which uh, uh, I mean, depending on what's uh, at stake. And uh, when I, I hope, I hope that uh, you enjoy this little tour and that it was not too uh, difficult to follow. And uh, as it was not possible to be together in the same room with Megan and Leslie Thompson, we thought that taking you all, I mean, first to my laboratory in Milano and then to my office in Rome was a, you know, a nice way to reiterate our proximity and to feel closer and present and uh, really to remind us, uh, each of us, I mean, can really uh, take responsibilities and are ready to take responsibilities for the next laboratory experiment and the next battle in all our parliaments in the interest of our societies, of the patients and the next generation of citizens. And yeah, really thanks for the award, for your attention, for being present and I'm ready to answer any question you may have. Okay, Elena, thank you so much. So incredibly inspiring. I feel like I'm there with you in Italy and just wanna get on a plane and be closer. <laughs> so thank You're you. You're welcome, um, all of you. We have a lot of questions and I'm going to introduce Dr. Leslie Thompson, who's going to be um, running with Elena for the question and answers. Leslie is a longtime Huntington's disease researcher. There she is. And she runs a lab at um, University of California, Irvine. And Leslie is our chair elect of our scientific advisory board for the HDF. So thank you, Leslie and Elena. Thanks so much. And Elena, I think for speak for all of us, that was absolutely beautiful and exciting and so interesting. And I love your philosophy and perspective. <laughs> it was great. So we have tons of questions. So I'll get over and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the first one is, uh, Dr. Catania, what an amazing journey through history you are taking us on. This is as you were talking. So one of the, her question, this person's question is, um, can you tell us what your laboratory is working on now that has emerged from the study of the HD gene, CAG repeats, sort of where you're going with that next? Yeah, I should say that we have 17 projects running. So this is one of them. And of course, I mean, our idea, and I know that Leslie and many colleagues share this idea, is that we need to know, I mean, everything about the normal gene to understand better how the mutation is affecting the survival and the functionality of our neurons. So in the lab, I mean, we work on trying to understand what is the structure function relationship. So the different pieces of the gene, of the protein, what do they do? I mean, do they talk together? Do they, I mean, uh, end up working together or in isolation? And the other thing we do, I mean, uh, I mean, as Leslie, we're very interested at the idea that uh, we can uh, uh, replace lost neurons in the brain of Huntington disease with new neurons. So there is a huge effort in the lab and in many labs trying to make new good neurons from stem cells for cell replacement strategies. Another part of the lab is working in trying to understand, I mean, what goes wrong when the mutation is there. And, uh, and of course, I mean, understanding what goes wrong allows you to develop strategies that compensate for that. And for example, in these studies, and there is a lot of discussion in the field, I mean, we realized the normal Huntington gene is important. So uh, uh, those are strategies that aim at blocking the toxic effect of the mutant gene 
should pay attention at not interfering with the normal function of the other copy of the gene that we have in our, in our cells, because we have two copies for each gene, okay? And one is normal here and the other is muted. So, you know, our philosophy is that, yeah, in order to, I mean, uh, reach the phase of a cure of a treatment, you need to understand the basic, you need to understand everything about the biology of the gene, the biology of the cells that are affected by the mutant gene. And then once you have a full comprehension, of course you will go much faster, I mean, toward treatment, but we're all united. I mean, we have so many collaboration and- uh, Yeah, yeah, thank you, Elena. Um, another, and there's a, quite a few questions along that, those lines in the Q and A, which you just answered beautifully, this balance between the loss of function of the normal protein and the toxic function of the abnormal, right? So um, one, this is an interesting question. Have you ever tried uh, adding the abnormal version of the HD gene to the plants? If so, what happens? <laughs> it's ongoing. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. ongoing. It is a great question, yeah. Okay, and then um, some of this you pretty much answered. So you showed benefit for the differentiation of stem cells into neuronal cells with the longer CAG. Uh, does this also happen if you differentiate stem cells into other cell types, or is it primarily neurons that has this effect? Yeah, this is a good question that has no answer at the moment. We haven't done that experiment yet, but of course we can do that because, you know, stem cells are, you know, a, a great uh, uh, tool that we can use in the lab to obtain a different specialized cell types of the human body. So we can yeah, definitely test that's that question by differentiating the cells to other lineages. Right, right. Um, uh, Bill also asks if, if there's any way that HD could be treated not by suppressing expression of the expanded allele, but by or by editing out the excess CAGs, but by doing something that would keep the extra CAGs from being toxic. So balancing that protect that beneficial potential effect you mentioned with longer repeats but suppressing the negative effects of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we should develop, we should devise an experiment now in order to identify clearly when the beneficial effects become toxic, when, they, when are they lost? And when, I mean, you enter into another type of curve now that uh, takes you to toxicity. Yeah, I think these are experiments yeah. we can design. Yeah, that'd be great. Another fascinating to think of people with HD are the pioneers. <laughs> that was a great comment. Have you heard of any animals or organisms with expanded repeats without developing symptoms of the HD or other similar diseases? I guess naturally occurring expanded alleles. I haven't seen, yeah. we haven't found any for the moment, but yeah. yeah. Uh, another question, this is interesting. Uh, fascinating talk, thank you. Given that CAG repeats are toxic, is evolution pushing us to the brink of extinction? <laughs> I think we don't no, quite know. No, 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 absolutely not. Probably, okay. probably evolution is using the CAG drive, which is important for our neuron, I don't know, to develop the next 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 generation of sapiens who knows right you know, you know, interesting. We're just speculating you know yes and we may go over just a couple minutes because there is so much interest in this and it's so great uh, josh myers writes with the advancements of crispr snipping the cag repeats and placing with normal repeats do you think this might interfere with the natural evolution you're referencing well not really because you would do that experiment in somatic cells and not in the germline. So that would be a great strategy to maintain the uh, you know, evolutionary uh, drive, a positive drive, and at the same time cure the disease without yeah. of course, interfering with germline. Right, right. Um, do you have any insights on why specific brain regions are affected by mutant Huntington? Uh, well, uh, there are ideas. No, for example, this goes back to the BDNF you know, study that we did, I mean, and uh, that it was replicated by many other groups. 
yeah, uh, we know that there is a lot of Huntington expressed in the cerebral cortex. And therefore, in the patients in Huntington disease, there is a lot of mutant Huntington expressed in the cerebral cortex. And the neurons in the cortex are very important uh, for their projection, among many other things, are very important for their projection to those striatum. And through those projections, they deliver to those striatum BDNF, wet brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is a very important neurotrophy for the striatal neuron. And years ago, we and others found that uh, normal antintin, again, I mean, the story of the normal gene being beneficial, is important for the production and delivery of BDNF from cortex to striatum. And when there is a mutation, uh, well, this posit positive effect is uh, basically lost. So why are the striatal neurons primarily affected? Maybe because the mutation causes a reduction in the BDNF production in the cortex, and therefore in a reduced delivery of the BDNF to the striatal neurons, which require BDNF for their survival, functionality, and normal physiology. So this is one example you know, that takes you to the brain circuitries. And there are, you know, specific brain circuitries that are very important. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. I'll just do two more questions. One, uh, Bill actually uh, came or answered, but the if there's CAG repeats in other genes that sometimes lead to other diseases. And sure. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But Remember. I can tell you, I can tell you, we look into, we did a sort of evolutionary history of those CAG repeats in other genes causing other diseases. And I can tell you that what I told you about the CAG in Huntington is unique to the CAG of the okay. Huntington gene. Oh, that's really interesting. So wonderful talk. Given the importance of collaboration you spoke about, is there an example when you have found it most effective and valuable? <laughs> you know, everything, everything. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you put more than one scientist in a room, a collaboration will start. You just need <laughs> more true. than one. You know? And, you know, they start talking, uh, uh, even if, you know, originally they don't know each other, they've never met before, you know, but as soon as there is a good idea on the table, yeah, more than one scientist is, is the trigger. And of course, having foundations like the Heredity Disease Foundation and other foundation cooperating with the science and the scientists have, have always been extremely important. I completely agree with that answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, so I'm going to end on this. There's also a, a note in the chat from Joan Stefan that you can answer that's more science-based that you guys can have a conversation. Um, but I'm going to end with this question. Uh, she said, beautiful talk, Elena, by the way. Okay, um, how can your role as a Senator for Life bring greater awareness to HD? I think this is a great question to end on. Well, you know, as a senator for life, I am sitting in the first row within the Senate. So I'm really the first row. So uh, how, I mean, can uh, this be, uh, bring more awareness? For example, I mean, uh, five years ago, uh, we organized a big ev event here in Rome, an uh, audience with Pope Francis. And that was also thanks to, you know, the Senate and people in the Senate. and Many patients actually were able, I mean, many of those who came to Rome, I mean, there were hundreds or thousands families and patients that came to Rome, I mean, for this old private audience with, with Pope Francis. Many of them uh, went, uh, were hosted uh, in the Senate and they met many politicians. And how can this role? Well, of course, I mean, uh, uh, we always uh, need, I mean, to keep our parliaments in uh, great alert toward what is needed. You no, know, uh, because in, I mean, especially in a country like Italy, you know, there are always a lot of problems on the table. And, uh, but the people and the people who suffer are, are the most important uh, person who needs to be helped and followed. So, you know, the way I'm helping is yeah, by inviting them in the Zuccari Hall, 
together with politicians. Members of the parliament have done that already several times. And uh, yeah, I, I think one way, the key way, I mean, to raise awareness is to put people together. They should feel they are part of the same society. We live very often far away from each other. You know, the different politicians are in their own world. Scientists are in their own worlds. And the patients and other, you know, groups are, you know, so we are all separated. You know, when you take, bring people together, you know, all the great things happen. And uh, yeah, this is, but of course, I mean, there are low degrees and uh, many things that we can do. Yeah. That was beautiful. And thank you so much. That was a perfect end to this and so appreciate your time. And that was fantastic. Thank you, Elena. And hand it off to Megan. Thank you so much, Leslie, for handling all the Q&A and giving Elena all those great questions. And thank you. Thank you very much. Elena, what a tour de force of the Huntington gene. Thank you so much. It was a fascinating presentation and terrific questions. And I, I want to just finish up by saying you started your presentation talking about how your career in Huntington's disease began with that warm hug that you received from HDF president Nancy Wexler. I feel, and I think probably a lot of our listeners and, and viewers feel like we've just received that huge warm hug from you with you explaining all of your research, showing us around your offices, and most important, helping us to recognize and see a new perspective about people with Huntington's disease and really just enveloping all of us into your world of research and advocating for patients. And I think your talk was just so perfect for Huntington's Disease Awareness Month. So thank you so much. Beautiful thank, talk. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And thanks, Leslie. And really thanks to all of you. And uh, yeah, really a lot of love from Italy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>